Okay. So, uh, well, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. I, I really appreciate uh, giving these talks about stuff that I've learned over the year, and uh, and I like to have this uh, kind of attendance. So, thanks a lot. Uh, the talk I'll give today is uh, is kind of a discussion around um, automating security updates, and it's a it's a kind of practice that I've taken in my uh, personal development. Uh, workflow over the last couple of years, and it's really paid a lot of div dividends for, uh, for myself and my team, so you don't have to think about automated security updates, or you don't have to think about security updates, period, unless they break something. So uh, that's, that gives us a lot more time to do, uh, to do some other productive stuff. So I'm Albert, um, I have a little shop, which is a one-man, uh, or let's say a two-man shop, D-Cycle, and we kind of focus on everything around automation. So automated unit tests, automated front-end tests, automated upgrades, that kind of thing. Um, I'd just like to, to hear a little bit about, more about, uh, about you guys. Like, how many of you have maybe experimented with some form of automation in your security update or your Drupal update uh, workflow? One guy, three, four guys. Okay, cool. Um, how much of your work goes into security updates? I'll give you my answer before I, say I started using this technique after, but like is it say less than 5%? Less than 5%, okay, so have a good workflow. Maybe 5 to 10? One guy? 10 to 20? Okay, a couple of people. So, what am I to understand here? That you don't do security updates or it takes more than 20% of your time? One or the other. Okay, so it does, it does take some time to do security updates, and um, so we want to minimize that as much as possible. How about, uh, do, you, do you guys uh, work with Docker locally, mostly, all of you? Does anyone not use Docker? Use stuff like MAMP or Dev Desktop or stuff like that? Okay, a couple of guys. Okay, Rupali. MAMP. Vagrant. Vagrant, okay, Vagrant, yeah. Vagrant, another one. Um, and do any, like, who, uh, who does automated testing like, on a regular basis? Can be any kind of testing. Can be like, not everything, maybe just a few things, continuous integration, okay, a couple of people as well. All right, so uh, that gives me an idea who, uh, who you are as we go along. So a typical Drupal code base, and, and this is probably stuff that's been around for like 10 years or more, the type of code base we have. Acquia uses this, I believe, Pantheon as well uh, uses this type of code base where you have Drupal core, like all every single line of code is in the code base. All the contrib modules are there, specific versions. You're going to have your custom code in there as well. Um, all the third-party libraries. You have the composer files and all that stuff. And the, you even have the generated CSS files from SAS. So every everything you need to run your site is in the code base. So the first thing that can get ugly is if you're using patches. So there's all kinds of different techniques when you're using patches. You have the patches folder up at the root of your, um, of your code base. And well, you know, when, when you come into a project and you're asked to do an update on something, you're like, okay, this patch is in the patches folder, but there's nothing that tells me that it was actually applied to the code. There's nothing that tells me that maybe some patches that were not in this patches folder were applied. So you still have to go through some, some kind of manual process to determine if you're really upgrading so if you're really upgrading what you think you're upgrading or are you upgrading some hacked version of something that's going to fail um, so the first kind of major pillar of what the the approach that I want to talk about today is a, a kind of a, 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 a two-tiered process for uh, developing or for for, for, bu for building sites and developing sites so on the one hand you have a kind of recipe for what your site's going to look like, and on the other hand, you have your actual site. So the recipe might use for you old school people, Drush Make. You can use Composer. In my case, I like to use Docker. I'll explain later on why. But the idea is to basically have a recipe that explains what your site assets are, and not actually include those assets in your code base. Uh, Composer does this really well. Docker as well, and Drush Make as well. And the the idea there is that you need to have some sort of a script in place to build your local environment based on these uh, files or um, and as well when you're pushing these to production you need to actually extract 
the result of this recipe and push into production. Questions on that, or does that make sense? Okay, this idea makes sense, all right. Um, so I'll give you a quick demo of, uh, I lost my internet access, but I hope it works anyway. Um, so I set up this uh, project here called the Drupal 8 Starter Kit, which, which is basically where I put all of my, all of my best practices, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a project that I use, that I'm hosting on GitHub, that I use for all of my new Drupal 8 projects. And it uses this exact system, where you have a recipe to build your site on the one hand, and you have your site on another. So this particular code base does not contain Drupal core, does not contain the contrib modules, but it still works. And it works because we're telling this, we're, we're telling, um, we're, we have a recipe that sets out how do we actually build the, um, build the uh, Drupal site. So the Docker file doesn't follow best practices. I'm sorry about this. It's actually a really old project that I'm maintaining as, uh, as I go along. But the fact that it's an old project says a lot about it. Because you can still download it today, run it, and you get the, you get the latest versions of every single um, of core and all of the contrib modules. So here is basically, in, in this particular case, I'm using the uh, Drupal, um, sorry, the uh, Drush 8 branch to download stuff, and then I, I'll build the, uh, the site using a script later on. You'll notice that I don't specify which versions of these I'm downloading, and um, the system that's going to build the site based on this recipe is going to get the latest versions at all times. So we'll give a quick demo of that. Okay, so I'm going to run a script called scripts deploy. If you download this, uh, by the way, and you run this, it's going to work on your computer, whether all you need as a dependency is Docker. You don't need Drush, you don't need MySQL, you don't need anything else. You just run scripts deploy. Obviously, you're security-minded security people, so look at the script before running it on your computer, but if you do run it, you'll get something like this. So the D8 starter kit, and it's actually going to start building Drupal. And it's going to download all here. You see it downloaded all the, the stuff. Um, and it's going to use a starter database that's in the Git repo itself. And it's going to build the project from scratch. You don't need to clone the database from anywhere. Everything is self-contained. And everything uses the exact latest versions of everything. So that's the first demo I wanted to give you, this idea of splitting the end code that you're pushing to production on the one hand and the code in your GitHub repo, which basically is a recipe for how to create these things. And whether you use Docker or Composer or whatever else you use, this idea is something that's, to me, a huge time saver for all kinds of reasons. Um, I'll give you one, another reason. Uh, when, you, when you do changes to code, looking at the diff, looking at the, uh, when you do code review, you don't end up reviewing changes to actual files or actual contrib modules. Those, all you do is end up reviewing a change of the number of the, or, or of the, um, the version of the contrib module you're downloading if you're not doing automated security updates. And if you are doing security updates, there, there really is no change to the code base. So here this took 17 seconds, which is not too much to, uh, to do a deployment. I've done it before, that's why it's all cached. And basically if I can go and visit this site, I don't have internet access, I believe, but I'll still go and see if this works. Yeah, there it is. So you'll notice that it, if you download this and run that command, you'll have exactly this code, which uses the latest versions of everything. There's some dummy content there, dummy article one. This is a dummy article. And that's in your code base. So self-contained code base separates the recipe and the actual code. All right. So... So just a quick kind of, for me, advantages of Docker as opposed to uh, stuff like Composer and, and Drush Make and so on. So Docker basically is a series of command line uh, commands. And we all know the command line already. We don't need to learn Ansible or, or Chef or, uh, you know, uh, Composer or whatever else it is. It's all, we, this is stuff we know already. And Docker obviously is not limited to Drupal and it's not limited to PHP. So you can basically use it for anything. and you can basically deploy anywhere as long as Docker is installed. And we'll see how, when we do continuous integration, that's something that's super important. Because if your project is self-contained on Docker, 
And these, this command I ran earlier that created a, a brand new Drupal site does not have any dependency other than Docker. You don't need to have MySQL or PHP or, or the testing tools or anything else on your computer. So you can take this and run it on any machine which has Docker installed. And that's great for continuous integration. Um, let's talk about the base image. So when we're talking about Docker, we normally build our, um, our recipe based on something like the Drupal base image, uh, the community base image, which looks like this. Uh, here it is on the Docker hub. So we'll go from Drupal 8, and then we build our, our um, we, we, we add all the modules we need and so on. The problem with the base Drupal image, the official Drupal image, is it gets updated with security updates two, three days after security updates come out, which in some cases is fine, but in some cases when you have some major security updates, you want to do it basically a few, you know, maybe an hour or two after they come out. So what I would recommend you guys do, and what I'm doing, is uh, using my custom base image, and I'm building it through a Jenkins server, and I'm building it every week on a Wednesday just after the security update period, and it's automated. Now I'm going to show you that, how I do that in a second. So back to the, um, yeah, so I'll show you the one I use. I'm using another one for another client. So basically have, splitting out this, um, we, we've already split out the recipe and the code. And another thing that I'd like you to think about is splitting out the base Docker image from your code. And the base Docker image can be its own project that gets built every week. And your code just basically builds on that foundation. Stop me if there's anything I'm saying that doesn't make sense or you'd like further clarification on. So another quick, uh, quick demo, um, I'd like to show you a uh, base image that I use personally, and I'd like to show you a uh, base image that I use for one of my clients, which is a uh, Stewart Healthcare. So, so here's my uh, D-cycle version of Drupal which is being built every single week after the security update window automatically based on, the, based on the base image, makes sure the code is up to date and installs Drush as well because the community uh, Drupal image does not contain Drush. So it makes it, in my opinion, uh, not that useful. Um, so you'll notice here, if you look at the tags, the automation that's going on here. So here that you can see that the last update of my my version 8, Drush 9, was two days ago. Two days ago was a Wednesday, right after the security update window. I don't have to do anything. This image gets built automatically. How does it get built? Um, I have a Jenkins server. It's pretty easy nowadays with Docker to set up a Jenkins server. And my Docker uh, Drupal project here builds it every Wednesday. And I get notified immediately, here on the 15th of May, for example, if there's any problem building this image for whatever reason. So I know right away, if I'm monitoring this thing, that, okay, the, the image didn't build for whatever reason, I'm going to fix it. In general, you, you'll notice that it does work. So I kind of rarely have to think about this stuff. It just works. The image gets built, and I don't even think about it. I'll show you another, um, another project that I maintain for a client, which is the Docker image for, let's just set this a bit larger here. So this is, a, this is a project I maintain for a client. I'm using from dcycle Drupal 8, which is the image I just showed you, which gets built every week. And based on that, I've done, I run everything I need to run. And these are the most important commands, basically installing all of my modules that I use for my project. And notice I don't specify versions of these. So every week when it gets built, it gets the latest versions. If it fails, it's going to stop, and I'm going to notice right away. Mm. And obviously, this client image as well gets built every week. And we'll notice that we had a bunch of failures on May 15. So May 15, something happened to the code that kind of broke my, my workflow. But since then, I haven't had any problem at all. Um, how does my code look for my client site? All I need to do is run from that image, give it a tag, and it always gets the latest one. So I, I don't need to think about versions of 
uh, different modules. All right. So the problem with Docker is once your computer has a version of the image in cache, it's going to keep using it forever until you tell it to stop. Hence, in the scripts deploy script, in the um, script slash deploy script I showed you earlier, I have a, okay, let's look at this one for example, um, scripts deploy. The first step of this is pulling the latest version of whatever base image I'm using. So, so the developer process is basically run scripts deploy and start working. So if there is a newer version of the image on the Docker Hub, it gets it. The important thing here is it becomes a lot more difficult to not do security updates than to do them. Because your regular process, you have to use the security updates. If you don't want security updates, you have to, you have to kind of hack it. All right. Obviously, and you know, a lot of people tell me I don't want to do automated security updates because I don't. I, I want to test my code before it goes live. I want to make sure that I'm in control of my security updates. So obviously, if you if you're in control of your security updates, you have le you, you have less of a chance of having unpredictable errors. Here's some of the errors I've encountered: Drupal cores that changes API slightly once in a while. If it wasn't used according to documentation, it might cause some errors. But then again. It's going to cause my project to fail if I'm, if I'm under continuous integration. A new dependency on an existing module, if you use Drush 8, it's going to fail because you're not downloading that module. For example, Webform, uh, I think a year back, got a new dependency. My script, my, uh, my uh, Docker image started failing, and I saw the error said unmet dependency, so I downloaded it. The third one is the worst, the third one is the worst kind. A change in some module causes the continuous integration server or the build process not to fail, but causes your site to break. And I'm going to talk about more about automated testing later on, but there's, to me, there is only one response to this last one. The first two you get notified in your CI process. This last one, if your tests are passing and your site breaks, that means you need to add more tests, in my opinion. And, that, and I, I've, I've basically had, a, uh, this, this happened to me quite a few times, and I'm not religious about writing tests. I, I, you know, I'm pretty lazy, actually. I don't write them that much. But if I get a failure like this, it makes it to production, especially, or even to staging, I'll write a test to make sure it's the last time I get a failure. I'm going to show you in a, in a few minutes how, um, how I can set that up. Well, actually, I'm going to show you right now. That was my next slide. <laughs> so, the idea of end-to-end -end testing is uh, that's kind of ex that's exactly what I'm talking about. To me, there's there's very little reason to rely on clicking around a website to make sure it works at this point, anyway, uh, because there's so many great tools for automated testing. Um, and manual testing is error prone too. It's, it's an extremely boring process. And most people are going are gonna to kind of not follow all the steps. They say, ah, oh, this works, this other thing should work too. And they're going to go fast and they're going to miss stuff. And so my recommendation for end-to-end -end testing would really be to start with something simple. I, one thing I've heard very often with testing, and I've been working with testing like for you know several years, people often say, well, it, what I want to test is so complex that I can't test it. I, I, don't, know, I don't have the, the experience to write this type of test. And my, my answer to that is, well, the reason you don't have the experience to write these complex tests is because you're not writing the simple tests to begin with because you're telling me this is too simple stuff. It doesn't need testing. And there's two problems with that approach. Is that first of all, you don't gain the experience of writing tests. And second of all, even the super simple stuff like I click on a link on the front page, it should, bring me to a, it should not bring me to a page not found. It seems simple, but once in a while you get these weird updates to, um, to Drupal modules at a core, which can break your routing, and that's going to fail. And, you, and, and so these super simple tests, or what I call smoke tests, are, are actually quite important. And we'll demo that right now. So, 
I'll just head back over here to the uh, starter kit. If you've, if you've actually downloaded this, you can play with this right now. You download the starter kit. Scripts Deploy is going to give you a brand new site on your computer. And the CI, if you link this to Circle CI, which is a one-click process, Circle CI is going to run a bunch of tests on that site that you're deploying. So one of those tests is an end-to-end -end test. And I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, it looks like this. Now, okay. Here's the main part of this, basically. Okay, I want to go to the. I want to go to Drupal slash user. Um, I want to enter my credentials, and I want to wait for a selector that's called nav.tabs. This is pretty pretty straightforward stuff. You have the template for it here. What's hard about this is all the scaffolding that goes around. You're like, okay, that. File is understandable, it's straightforward, I can copy paste it, but where do I put it? What do I use to run it? What do, I, what do I need to install on my computer or on my CI server to run these tests? And the answer is nothing if you take the Drupal 8 starter kit and you run the end-to-end test.sh script, because it takes care of everything for you. It does everything on Docker containers, so you don't have any dependencies. And I'll show you that in a second. So if you have downloaded this, you can run scripts, end-to-end -end tests. I don't have internet access, so I hope this is going to work. So first thing it does is it, it uses Drush to update the password of user1 so that my test can actually know how to log in. Because I want to, don't forget, I want to test internal pages, not only external pages. I'm going to go to node1, uh, in this case, where's my, okay, node1edit. Um, I want to make sure that, uh, um, that I can see something. I want to take a screenshot of it so that if someone wants to view the artifact later on, they can. And if this doesn't work for whatever reason, your security update to, to module XYZ broke this process, it's, this is going to fail and you're going to get a big red box on your uh, continuous integration server. Let's see what this does with the artifacts, which is kind of interesting. So, oops, sorry. This actually saves the artifacts of what it does to screenshots. So here are the screenshots, they're PNG files, and it, it tells you exactly what it's doing. It, it shows you basically what the test is seeing. So if the test fails, you know, you're expecting, say, to see, I don't know, you're expecting to see the word title there, and you're not. Well, you can go and see what, what is the test actually seeing. So this type of automated testing removes responsibility from the developers who find it really boring to do this stuff and places that responsibility on a machine instead. How does this work with CI? Here's my Drupal 8 starter kit continuous integration board, which is Circle CI. Circle CI is not rocket science. You open an account, you associate it with your project, and you're good to go. There's really nothing else to do. And if you fork the Drupal 8 starter kit project, you can get going in maybe five minutes. So this is not rocket science. Um, so what, is, what does Circle CI do? It runs a bunch of tests. Well, first of all, it builds, it, it creates a new virtual machine which has one thing on it, which has Docker on it, okay? Um, and because everything we do has only one dependency, Docker, it can start running tests. So it, start by, it starts by running scripts deploy. It's, it, well, it starts by actually looking for, um, does, does some linting, it does some unit tests, all that stuff, and it runs scripts deploy. It makes sure that we actually manage to download everything, uh, everything works. And at the end, it's going to run those end-to-end -end tests, which are here. And that's where it's going to fail if, for whatever reason, the module you downloaded doesn't work. And because it's saved, it not only saves screenshots, you can actually save the state of the DOM as well. So I'm, I'm going to go one step further and I'm going to use um, an accessibility tester to actually make sure that I don't have that many errors. In this case, I'm telling my accessibility tester I don't want more than 25 errors. Say. And so I'll see the errors there are. If for, what, if for whatever reason I have more than that threshold of errors that I've that I told it, accessibility errors, it's going to fail. So all of those tests are kind of built into my process. And so it, I don't no longer need to actually worry about 
what security, what changes security updates are going to make to my code that are going to break my site. Because if they do break the site, that means you need more automated tests. Okay. Um, CI, well, these are things I talked about earlier. Super important to always make sure your, your process includes getting the latest version of the, the image because you, we know that our image is being updated every Wednesday after the uh, security update window. So we can't assume that the, the cached version of our image, which is in our computer, corresponds to the image that's on the Docker Hub. Um, CI, actually I just showed you this uh, CI stuff, so I'll move on. So what happens with when you have like super security, you know, critical issues like Drupal Geddon? It turns out, and I've dealt with Drupal Geddon using this exact process, it turns out that Drupal Geddon is just an update. You just do a build and it's all automated. You get, like, you know that your Jenkins server rebuilds your entire Drupal, you know it passed. Just run a deploy. If your tests pass, you push to production. And using this process, fixing these major security updates, it's just another update. There's no change to your, to your process. You just run the, the, you just press the button on your CI server, it updates to production and you're done. So that takes a lot of stress away from the development team to know that they don't need to think about this stuff. Obviously, if it's Drupal Geddon, you have to kind of keep an eye on it, make sure it doesn't fail, a little bit more than usual, but the important thing is it fits into your regular um, workflow. Um, to finish off, I, I want to talk about a deploying to non-Docker production hosts. So obviously this is all Docker stuff. We want to deploy to Aquila, we want to deploy to you know, Pantheon, we want to deploy to maybe some other host which is not Docker native. So when you on your local machine or on your CI server build this thing and test it and make sure it works, the entire code base exists in your Docker container. So all you need to do is a Docker copy from your Docker container to some other location, temporary location, and rsync that or push it to a Git repo for Acquia or whatever to um, to deploy to production. To my, in my view, that's a lot preferable than actually pushing some composer JSON file or, or, or uh, what's that other thing, uh, Drush make to production and building your code there because it's a lot more error prone. Our syncing files is, there's, you're almost never gonna have errors and you already tested those exact files. You're gonna push those files you've already tested to your production hosts. And I do this with Acquia all the time. We do deployments several times a week, all automated, and we hardly ever think about it. So conclusion, a few, a few kind of things that, I, in my opinion anyway, are, are kind of really, you know, if you don't do these, your, your whole uh, setup's gonna break if you try to do automated security updates, I think. So first of all, Docker, I mean, you know, other stuff like Vagrant might work as well, but then you need to figure out how to install Vagrant on your CI server, and it's super slow. And so I, I personally can't think of a way other than Docker to have this type of workflow. CI, obviously, wants continuous integration, which is a super cheap way to catch errors fast. Uh, build images, any automated task you want to do. Um, Circle CI is free, by the way. Uh, for I think 1,500 minutes a month or something, so I've never actually paid for it myself. Um, so continuous integration also is a no-brainer, because otherwise you don't know when your failures occur. A build step, so that idea of splitting out the recipe on the one hand, the docker or whatever it is, and the idea of uh, the actual code that's running on your machine. And the last thing I think, which is a no-brainer, is automated tests. And automated tests can be the simplest kind. You can have like one test. Just make sure you can deploy. That's a test, you know. But run your test on your CI server. As your site gets more mission critical, run more tests. But start with one simple test just to get into the habit of testing. So that's pretty much, uh, I, I actually tried to keep it a bit short because uh, when, I present it, when I present these ideas, I often get a lot, lots of questions. You seem like a tired bunch, but at the same time, you know, you, you might have, you might still have some questions, and, and, and there's, there's no question to doubt, really. Uh, so, go ahead, Chris. 
Uh, so at what point do you run update.php on the production process? Okay, so the that's a good point actually. When I'm deploying to a non-Docker production host, uh, there's a there's a deployment script that I use, which basically R syncs everything from my uh, Docker host to my production or my staging server, basically. You want to do staging before production, obviously. And step two would be to run uh, uh, your update drush at db, and you would also run drush cim, which imports your new configuration. Uh, there's a bu I'll, I'll actually show you. It's a really good question. Um, so here's an example of an update script for production that I use for Acquia. Um, so I'll run CR. I'll clear my caches. This is a really simple one. I'll run C, uh, clear caches. I'm going to run updb, and I'm going to run uh, cim. So what, what that does, clear your cache. Clear your cache. Updb runs updates that your code might have on your, um, to your database schemas. And drush cim is config import is going to take all the new fields and content types and views and stuff that you've built and move them into production. And running another script after that as a um, to to show the login script to log into the staging site so you can click around. So this is an example of a, a script that I use to update uh, my my production server, and it's super simple. Can get a bit more complex. Um, anyway, you can come see me later on if you want to know. But I, but in once in a while you'll run into issues where you know you have to like cron can fail for whatever reason. So in some of my sites. I run cron as part of the update procedure uh, on my staging site so that if cron fails, I know right away. So if, sometimes you need to do that, sometimes you don't. Uh, I think there's entity update, drush entity update, you'll need that once in a while as well. So, so depending on your site, you basically define what your update script is. That's the way I do it. So every time you, every time you are saying you run that script. Exactly, then, exactly. It's exactly. set to non-Docker instances, so that like in your case, uh, production is never Docker. In my case, production is never Docker on, on client sites. I use experimental sites I use myself. I have uh, Kubernetes or Docker instances uh, on, not production, but because it's, it's basically experimental. Uh, in which case, I would run a script similar to that, but there would be no rsync. You would basically push your Docker image, right. and then you would get your, uh, your production site to get the latest version of that image. It's a bit of a different process. I don't, who does Docker on production here? <laughs> One guy. You should give a talk about that. Because <laughs> I, I have kind of, uh, I'm not there yet. Docker on production, so uh, I would be very happy to hear more about how you do that stuff. But uh, just a mess. <laughs> 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 Glad Okay, we'll talk more. <laughs> All right, so that's a uh, good question. So back there. Yeah, so if you do another thing for your production site, how do you deal with the configuration? Uh, with all the configuration, uh, for example, the other configuration that is supposed to be excluded. Uh, you mean like the split developer configuration and production? Yeah, configuration? so for example, sometimes some configuration is not in the production side, right? So right. That's actually a really good question. Well, have you guys used config split before? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you, I, okay, so you can do that. Um, you, can, you can use config as. So you can use config split to basically decide what what you what what configuration files make it to production. I'm going to show you one uh, one one other trick I use here when I deploy. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick because that's a really good question. Uh, one second here. Update. Um, okay, here it is. So. In my case, I didn't, in this particular case, I didn't use config split. This is maybe a little bit advanced, but I, I still want to kind of mention it. If you don't understand the code, don't worry about it. The idea here is that instead of exporting everything, I know that like approximately 100% of my clients don't want web forms to be configuration, yet they are. So this is something I, I use all the time. It's like, I'll export, I'll, okay, I'll just tell you what I mean. I'm exporting my config locally. I'm excluding all of the um, web forms, throwing those out, and then I'm re-importing, and then I'm exporting the existing web forms on an existing project, 
I'm combining those two together, and I'm then re-importing everything. So it's a bit of a hack, but it works. I've been using this for years, and it works perfectly. Uh, once in a while, you have, let's say, some clients say, I'd like to, like to run to do some views locally. So I can say, OK, fine. Like, all of the views that our configuration developers do should be preceded by the word you know, in code underscore. And if any view that's not in there is not going to be uh, it's not going to be overwritten. So you can do some kind. You can use config split. You can use this type of uh, scenario. I I really like to to do a scripting. So this is the type of thing that I feel comfortable with. But conf config split obviously is another uh, possibility. As long as you can from the command line make it work. Uh, it's it's I've used config config split as well, and that's uh, that's worked fine. Yeah. Yeah. So how. This one problem I, I have when I'm doing updates is if, um, patches. Like if there's oh, like, yeah. if patches are right. are no longer needed, like the models committed to. Okay, the let's, let's I'll, I'll uh, answer that. It's a really good question. Actually, that was the, it's funny because that was like the initial thing that got me thinking. Hey, I'll, I'll make a talk about patches, and I completely forgot to talk about it. But I'm going to answer that question. <laughs> so. I'll head back to the, um, the Docker file I showed you earlier. Now, this is a Docker file, which basically is a, it says it's a recipe to build an image, okay? So we're downloading all of our modules, and at the very end here, all of this, if, you, if you're wondering, by the way, why I'm doing it like all on one line, it's to make the Docker file a lot smaller. Uh, it's a bit hard to read, though, but basically every single patch, let's say, I don't know, this field group patch here. So I'm going to run this. So it's basically going to, um, sorry, here are these four lines. So I'm basically going to say, well, field group in this particular project, you know, the, 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 the official release does not work for me. I want to have, I, I need to have this modification, this patch. So I'm going to download it, curl O, it mod downloads it, and I'm going to patch, so I'm going to change that module, and then I'm going to delete that patch, I'm going to move on to my next patch, and so on. So what I understand from your question is, what happens when those patches get, either they're no longer applied, or they get merged in, or whatever. Or there's a new patch for like a new version of the okay. module. I, so there's two, two, di two, di two, two different questions there. The first one is, if it fails for whatever reason, it's been merged into to the, the, the official branch, uh, it no longer applies for whatever reason because the underlying code is, is different or something, this line is going to fail. And I'm going to see in my CI server, I'm going to see this here. If you're running Jenkins, you're going to see this in this, you're going to, your console output is going to be red. And you're going to be seeing the problem down here. It's going to be saying, well, uh, patch, here it is. So it's going to be saying, this, this is going to fail. Say, I can't apply the patch. You're going to see it. You're red. You're going to be seeing this patch no longer applies here. And that's actually a really good question because as part of your workflow as a developer, it's going to be your responsibility to say, OK, the, the web form patch, whatever is, is failing, it's your responsibility to go into the community, to the Drupal site, uh, to the Drupal.org, look at the issue, understand why it's no longer applying, debug it, submit a new version, and so on. And you know what often happens is because I use this process, I'm very often among the first people to realize that patches no longer apply. So I have a lot of activity on Drupal.org where I'm like, okay, this no longer applies, here, make this change. And you learn a lot about modules, about the underlying technology, when you have to deal with that stuff. And that, to me, is super positive. But it is a time-consuming thing. So you have to kind of be aware of that if you use this technique. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Somewhat? Yeah. yeah. You don't seem too, too convinced. No, well, I was hoping for something different. Yeah, I was hoping to, you know, something that would <laughs> have you to work. So I wouldn't be able, need to go through, you know, you know, 25 comments of the issue queue to okay, how about this? determine whether it was really needed. Let's say for whatever reason your patch fails and you're like, I don't want to deal with this, but it was passing on version 3.21. At this point, you can go into your composer file and say, well, you know, for meta tag, I no longer care about security updates. I want to stick to 
3.21 is I don't want to deal with figuring out why the patch no longer applies. You can do that as well and offload that uh, responsibility downstream. But, I mean, if you're in a rush or whatever for a deployment, you could do that as well, for sure. Hey. When is, when is Composer running? Uh, is this in the Docker file? Well, Composer's running basically to... Oh, sorry, there, I didn't see it. Yeah. Okay, so like all the, like all the, the massive pile of stuff in Pender that you need to actually run Drupal 8, that you're just... I'm doing it in a uh, Docker image. Yeah. All if that the, fails, okay. I'll get notified. So, can you, so you are using Composer to fetch the modules? Well, I'm using right? Composer here because I'm using as a base image the tag 8 rush 9. Yeah. But, since you ask. You're not, you're not using Drush to fetch the modules? Well, Dr uh, well Drush 9 no longer supports Drush DL. But Drush 8 does. So if you look at my starter right. kit, I'm no longer, I haven't upgraded to Drush 9 yet. I'm using the 8 tag, which uses Drush 8, which supports Drush DL. So you can see here I'm using Drush DL. So you can use the tag, whatever tag you want. You Drush 9 with yeah. Composer or Drush 8 with Drush DL. Good. About the patch, so why not putting that in the Composer to Say again? Oh, yeah. The patch is doing. Yeah. What you're doing. Why are you? Doing curl and everything. Uh, I kind of like the command line. Okay. I mean, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's, if you like to put it in a composer file, put, I don't like composer personally. Okay. I know I'm I, I know I'm the only one in the, in the world, but I, I kind of kind of bugs me. I, I don't I, I don't kind of feel it. You're not. I like you're, you're not the only one. Not? No. No. Okay. I, I I hate it to be honest. So I'll use it if I have to, but I don't see why I wouldn't use just use the command line curl directly. I don't see any problem with that. Rupal, you had a problem. You had a can you had a problem. No. Yeah. Can I see your directory structure? Where do you keep your Docker image? Where do you keep yeah, yeah, sure. So obviously you can download this as well, um, but I will show you that the directory structure, which makes it much larger, because I know that when I'm sitting in the back and things are small, I don't like it. Okay. So here it is. So Circle CI is basically all of the, um, the continuous integration stuff, and that's super simple. It's basically just running one command on a new image with Docker, a new uh, VM with Docker installed. Um, then you have all the Drupal stuff, like for example, the custom modules. You'll notice that the directory structure, so you have Drupal custom modules. What is that? This is not Drupal directory structure. How does that become a Drupal directory structure? Well, this is, you know, this is uh, Docker. So in the Docker compose file, I'm going to say, well, I want you to map Drupal custom modules on my local directory to the actual real place it should be on the container. So that's basically how I set it up. But you can put your directory structure however it feels best to you, and then just map stuff in your Docker compose file. The most important thing here is um, the scripts folder, which contains all of the different scripts that you might want to use, like for example, to export the configuration from your, um, from your local uh, container, uh, your end-to-end -end tests, your deployment scripts, uh, your unit tests, and so on. How do, you, how do you pull config from... So do you... Do you... Do you ever need to pull config from production, for example, the web forms you're describing? Well, what I would do is I would pull the database. You do, you pull, use the database yeah. and then you export locally. You configuration export locally from, with like, load database, well, my, my, dump YAML. Yeah, my, in my case, I never actually want to have those web forms as config. You just, okay, you just completely I, I just, ignore it. I just assume they're database only. Because that's what my clients want. You, that's how you treat them. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And, and then everything. Okay. And then everything but, else. The, you, you define it as YAML and Docker, and then I guess pushed up and content <laughs> is coming from the database, and you're just dumping that and load it, loading it locally in, in Docker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I have a. Um, I just want to show you something real quick here. Uh, I have a get database from stage. Right. Um, from script, which basically gets my database from, from stage. stage, not not production. Yeah, I don't want to touch production. I want to. I don't want to have like these these like intensive database, you know, well, up, uh, exports from production. Okay. Well, yeah. anyways. But you can get it from where you want. But but, but in, in, for, at least for this client, that's that's good enough. Yeah. Exactly. 
Like basically the, the idea, what I like about this approach that everything is scripted is you do whatever's right for you. There's no, the tool is not telling you what to do. The, the it's point, more of an, an idea or a process. The point is that there is a script. So whatever the logic is, you're not exactly. doing it by hand. Yeah. Exactly, you're automating. Yeah. Which is what I do. Yeah. Back here. Yeah, um, maybe uh, my question was like, a, I'm just a bit confused, I'll feel, hopefully you help me. So, so from the development stage, you, you, with this script, you push to production, right? Yeah, so, well, I push to I would push to staging normally. Yeah, and production to staging or whatever. Yeah. But, but to me, uh, gets development to production. Uh, why is uh, why are you taking this approach instead? To me, it's I don't know if it's a best practice instead of using, for example, just get and merge all the changes. Uh, as for the configuration, is why I meant for. I mean, like you do Git instead of rsync if I want to move yes. to production. Right. I actually use Git on a lot of projects as well. Like Acquia requires you to use also, Git. Also, this is just another approach. This is an example because okay. like Acquia has a Git repo and it requires you to use Git. So you don't have a choice but to export everything from your local container to the Acquia Git repo and then run a Git, you know, Git um, tag and push it to Acquia. And but you don't really think about that stuff because it's all done automatically. You don't actually ever touch that Git repo, but it does use Git. Other hosts are going to accept rsync. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me just see what time it is, because I think... Um, so I think that, that I'll, I'll take questions for sure. If anyone is anxious to leave and get coffee, I won't be offended, because the talk is officially over. But uh, for those of you who want to stay, I'll, I'll take the remaining questions uh, with pleasure. So over here. Yeah, so I know this is not productive, but do you think my migrating the database like this would scale up in production? Migrating the database, meaning? Like you migrating configs from the database, you just migrating the database. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. you think it would scale up in production like the other huge database taking it down from the database? Um well Two answers to that. First of all, yes, it does. I use it with a two gigabyte database with no issue whatsoever. Uh, and second of all, I, I tend to not use the production database all that much. I tend to reproduce the functionality I need in my starter database. So this idea of a starter database where I have this new content type, X, Y, Z. As I deploy that, I'm also going to deploy at the same time examples of what X, Y, Z nodes would look like. And I would push the, and I would put those in my local database, and then I'd export them to my local Git repo. So I always have this kind of starter database, which contains data which is representative of my production database that I can have developers play around with. I can run automated, you know, unit, uh, uh, sorry, end-to-end -end tests and accessibility tests against. So I, I, I don't actually that often clone the production database, but it does work fine. Um, in, in my experience, it has scaled up uh, very well. Yeah, personally. Yeah, okay. Hello. I was going to say that uh, or Acquia VLT uh, does something sort of similar where you have sort of a source repo and it calls the other thing an artifact repo, and I found those terms to be really useful. It's like a source repo and an artifact repo when you're trying to refer to, I've got this one repo that looks nothing like the <laughs> yeah. Nothing like the production one. That's, that's a good that's point. The source one and the one that does actually look like a Drupal site. Artifact so, repo. Yeah, that's actually true. Build an in, in VLT. So, so VLT, my understanding, I haven't used it, but my understanding is it's a product that's Acquia specific. Yeah. Uh, whereas I'm trying to build something that's, that you can use anywhere. But the terminology. But the used. terminology of artifact is actually the terminology that's, uh, that's used in, uh, when we're talking about builds. So absolutely, those terminology are very... Uh, and I should have used them in my talk, actually. But that's a really good point. The source is really your, your recipe, and then the artifacts is, is the result. One of the reasons I haven't used that terminology, perhaps, is that people who are not coming in from a background where they've thought about this stuff, that kind of can sound jargony a bit in some instances, but it's a good idea to get used to using those, uh, those terms, absolutely. All right, so... Uh, Oh, I keep asking questions. Any questions? Yeah. You, you guys can leave. I, I really don't mind. <laughs> You're not going to be offended. You can leave too. <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, Do you use something like stage file proxy for assets? Yeah, I use stage file. That's a really, really good thing. Because 
you can have like a gigabyte of files and you don't want, I don't want to download them. So safe file proxy works perfectly and yeah, absolutely. Yes. What is hard to These are your successors. Human beings are hard to automate. <laughs> There's my answer. Human beings who like who, who, who come to an agile sprint planning and say, okay, five is good, and then they call you the next day with five new tickets, and you're like, what were these tickets yesterday? Those human beings are hard to Fair enough.